Good morning, Hypatia. And as I promised, or rather as I threatened, here is the little something for you today. Um, yet again, I have deviated from uh, <laughs> what we should be reading, <laughs> because yesterday, uh, um, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Dalloway was kind enough to send me through the post via Amazon a collection of her selected essays, and uh, I know that we both um, admire whatever Mrs. Dalloway has to say. Um, so I shall plunge into this and uh, have a quick um, read of something that I hope is relevant. Um, yes, this is, uh, oh yes, this is from an essay called Character in Fiction. And I know that we are both um, very interested in, uh, in character and in fiction, truth and reality, and whether people are real or not. Hmm. Uh, anyway, let's just let Virginia take over, I think. <clears throat> oh, yeah, sorry, she is um, here. This is the text of a speech that she gave in ooh, 1924. Gosh, very early. Well, not very early. Probably about right for her. I don't know why I said very early then. Um, in response to uh, an article that a writer called Arnold, Arnold Bennett had written. Um, Arnold Bennett was a very prolific writer of the time, and I've never read anything that he's written, um, and I probably won't. Uh, so, anyway, he wrote something, um, I think in response to Virginia Woolf's claim that the novel was decaying. Um, and he got rather cross. Anyway, I'll read now. But now I must recall what Mr. Arnold Bennett says. He says that it is only if the characters are real that the novel has any chance of surviving. Otherwise, it must die. But, I ask myself, what is reality? And who are the judges of reality? Good questions, Virginia. Um, a character may be real to Mr. Bennett, and quite unreal to me. For instance, in his article, he says that Dr. Watson in Sherlock Holmes is real to him. To me, Dr. Watson is a sack stuffed with straw, a dummy. A figure of fun. And so it is with character after character, in book after book. There is nothing that people differ about more than the reality of characters, especially in contemporary books. But if you take a larger view, I think that Mr. Bennett is perfectly right. If, that is, you think of the novels which seems which, sorry which seem to you great novels war and peace vanity fair tristram shandy madame bovary pride and prejudice the mayor of casterbridge villette if you think of these books you do at once think of some character who has seemed to you so real I do not mean merely lifelike by that. That the book has the power to, th to make you think of it itself, but also all sorts of things through its eyes. Of religion, of love, of war, of peace, of family life, of, of balls in country towns, 
of sunsets, moonrises, the immortality of the soul. There is hardly any subject of human experience that is left out of war and peace, it seems to me. And in all these novels, all these great novelists have brought us to see whatever they wish us to see. Otherwise they would not be novelists, or but rather poets, or historians, or pamphleteers. But let us now examine what Mr. Bennett went on to say. He said that there was no great novelist among the Georgian writers, because they cannot create characters which are true, real, and convincing. And there I cannot agree. There are reasons, excuses, possibilities, which I think put a different colour upon the case. It seems to me, at least, but I am well aware that this is a matter about which I am likely to be prejudiced and near-sighted. I will put my view before you in the hope that you will find it impartial, judicial, and broad-minded. Why, then, is it so hard for novelists at present to create characters which seem real not only to Mr. Bennett, but to the world? Why, when October comes round, do the publishers always fail to supply us with a masterpiece? Surely one reason is that the men and women who began writing novels in 1910 or thereabouts had this, great, had this great difficulty to face, that there was no English novelist from whom they could learn their business. business. <laughs> Mr. Conrad is a pole which sets him apart and makes him, however admirable, not very helpful. Well, I think Polish people are very helpful. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Mr. Hardy has written no novel since 1895. The most prominent and successful novelists in the year 1910 were, I suppose, Mr. Wells, Mr. Bennett and Mr. Goldsworthy. Now it seems to me that to go to these great men and ask them to teach you how to write a novel, how to create characters that are real, is precisely like going to a boot me bootmaker and asking him to teach you how to make a watch. Do not let me give you the impression that I do not admire or enjoy their books. They, their books seem to me of great value. There are seasons... But, but, sorry, but there are seasons when it is more important to have boots than to have watches. To drop the metaphor, I think that after the creative activity of the Victorian age, it was quite necessary, not for literature, but for life, that someone should write the books that Mr. Wells, Mr. Bennett, and Mr. Galsworthy have written. Yet what odd books they are. Sometimes I wonder if we are right to call them books at all. For they leave one with so strange a feeling of incompleteness and dissatisfaction. In order to complete them, it seems necessary to do something. To join a society, or more desperately, to write a cheque. That done, the restlessness is laid. The book finished. It can be put upon the shelf and never be read again. But with the work of other novelists, it is different. Tristram Shandy, or Pride and Prejudice, is complete in itself. It is self-contained. It leaves one with no desire to do anything, except 
to read the book again and to understand it better. The difference, perhaps, is that both Stern and Jane Austen were interested in the things themselves, in character itself, in the book itself. Therefore, everything was inside the book, nothing outside. But the Edwardians were never interested in character itself or in the book itself. They were interested in something outside. Their books, then, were incomplete as books, and required that the reader should finish them actively and practically for himself. And I am very sorry that I read that so badly. <clears throat> um, she writes wonderful sentences uh, that I didn't quite... I was too lazy. I should have read them through first. I just read them um, spontaneously. Uh, and not surprisingly, she confused me because she's rather good. Um, her sentences, yeah, aren't quite as <laughs> bad as the man who wrote Caves of God, whose name I have forgotten. Uh, <laughs> I shall get back to that very shortly. Um... Anyway, she makes me think, which is a nice thing, even if thoughts aren't very clear. Um, I'm sure that your thoughts today are extremely clear, and I hope they are happy and uh, enlightening thoughts. I shall speak to you sometime soon. Bye-bye.